Last year, Governor Baker signed legislation addressing the opioid epidemic that's claiming lives and devastating families all across the Commonwealth and the nation. Dr. Robert Roos, the Vice President of Behavioral Health at Mercy Medical Center, served on the governor's working committee on the crisis. He sat down with Carolee McGrath recently to talk about Mercy's plans to expand opioid treatment and recovery programs. Mercy, we're very proud to be leading some of the efforts here in this community addressing the opiate crisis. There's no more important issue for us as a hospital system to address, and there's no issue that ties deeper to our mission to take care of our community and really be a healing, transforming presence here in this community. One of our uh, initiatives that we are embarked upon is to expand access to treatment by adding new levels of care so patients can access treatment and then sustain their recovery over a longer term. In addition to that, we're also looking to enhance our current facilities so that the quality of our facilities is at the same standard as other conditions where other facilities where patients would receive care for, for example, cancer or cardiovascular disease. And we're also really looking to step out um, as a leader and educate not only providers and the public, but also potentially policymakers and legislators about how important this issue is so we can lead to more change um, over time. So you have um, a different sort of setup though. These are going to be beds that are sort of a step down from the traditional detox. Is that what it is? That's right. So recently we've been engaged in two major efforts to expand access to treatment. One of those is to expand access in our opioid treatment program, which is an outpatient based treatment that combines both medication and therapy, which has been shown to be the most effective form of treatment over the long term for opiate addiction. And we have expanded our capacity to treat patients with methadone and therapy at our Holyoke location through renovations and uh, increasing our staffing. How critical is that to have that time? Because I know about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, when uh, we were talking about, you know, different ways to address the problem, you know, one of the things that was brought up was after detox, you know, people going back to life, it can be, you know, extremely difficult for them. How, how critical yeah. is this time? Time is, is everything in this disease. Addiction is a chronic disease, a chronic disease of, the, disease of the brain that impacts how people think and the decisions that they make. And what we know is that a week of treatment is not a solution for a chronic disease. A week of treatment where people are receiving medications to detox or to stabilize from withdrawal is really an entry point where we can stabilize the body so that slowly you can start to introduce clinical interventions, different ways to think, different ways to um, understand why there's cravings, and different coping skills to mitigate that and to address that, that you start to introduce that over time so that people can sustain and self-manage those issues on their own once they return home or return to uh, outpatient. But recovery can be a lifetime, can it? Absolutely. There, there's more than 25 million people living in long-term recovery in the United States, and that's a story that often goes untold because most people or many people choose to stay anonymous mm -hmm. in that long-term recovery. But you know, what, so what we know to be true is that when people enter treatment and they can sustain it and they develop those skills and tools to sustain their recovery, it is something that changes the individuals, their families, and the community. Now, um, you were part of the governor's um, working group on this. Are you pleased to see the changes that have been made in the last uh, year or so? Absolutely. Now, um, I, will, I will say that we know that data just came out last week that showed that the number of overdose deaths continues to increase. So from 2013 to 2016, the number of opiate overdose deaths has continued to rise. But I don't want that, uh, I don't want the work that's ongoing to get lost in just that statistic. And because I think what we know now is that this crisis, this is not a small crisis, mm -hmm. and there is no quick fix. But the plans that were laid out from the working group and the vision and the strategy that has been implemented over the course of the last year and a half, I believe is setting a foundation for how we can continue to address this now, in the short term, and in the long term to set our community up to really combat this disease in the appropriate way. And how do you talk to kids about it? Because I, I know you're supposed to, and I, I know I've been told by, by different medical professionals that you need to introduce the topic. But as a mother, um, you know, who's very anxious about everything that her kids can see and hear, you know, my first instinct is don't tell them anything until they need to know it, which I'm sure there's probably doctors out there saying, oh my gosh, it's the wrong thing to do. But wh what is the appropriate age to introduce this? Yeah, so I don't, so uh, let me first just by start by saying you're on 
absolutely on the right track. Prevention is really a key part of this plan that the Governor's Working Group put together as well as what the community needs to really help address and combat this crisis over time. And one element of prevention that is so important is working with young people. And that involves both education in schools, but it also involves the role of parents and positive role models in people's life. I don't know if there's a magic age um, in which we should start that conversation, but certainly we have realized over time that earlier and earlier is likely to be better because in, cause kids will get exposed to substance use in various ways, whether we intend to or not, through television, through peers, through other adults. And the earlier we can start the conversation about the reality of what substance use or addiction can bring and help provide coping mechanisms to deal with stressors, um, tools to combat peer pressure, and provide positive, pro-social, active activities for our young people, that's where we will really start to see uh, positive improvements in terms of the rates of addiction in my mind. Dr. Robert Roos, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and uh, good luck.